wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're certainly appreciative that you tuned in today. Thanks for coming in for another podcast. Be sure to watch the video version of this. You're definitely going to watch it. This book just topped the New York Times bestseller list. It's Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power by Susan Page. We're going to get a chance to interview her today. To see this video interview, go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification. Go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss and take and uh, see everything we're reviewing and reading over there. Go to all of our big groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, everywhere the Chris Voss show is, and you can see the interview there and also get more details and order up the book. And this episode is brought to you by a sponsor, ifi audio.com and their micro idsd signature it's a top of the range desktop transportable DAC and headphone app that will supercharge your headphones it has two brown burr DAC chips in it and will decode high-res audio and MQA files. We're using it in the studio right now. I've loved my experience with it so far. It just makes everything sound so much more richer and better and takes things to the next level. IFI Audio is an award-winning audio tech company with one aim in mind, to improve your music enjoyment of quality sound, eradicate noise, distortion, and hiss from your listening experience. Check out their new incredible lineup of DACs and audio enhancement devices at ifi-audio.com. Today, Susan Page is on the show. She is the uh, Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today, where she writes about the White House and national politics. She is the author of Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, and the Lessons of Power, a biography of Nancy Pelosi, published in April 2021. Her first book, The Matriarch, Barbara Bush and the Making of an American Dynasty, published in 2019, was a New York Times bestseller as well. Susan has covered 11 presidential elections and is now covering her seventh White House administration. She has interviewed the past 10 presidents and reported from six continents and dozens of foreign countries. She has won every journalism award given specifically for the coverage of the presidency. And in 2020, she moderated the vice presidential debate between Mike Pence and Kamala Harris. She frequently appears as an analyst on TV and radio. Welcome to the show, Susan. How are you? I'm doing well, Chris. It's great to be with you today. Awesome sauce. And congratulations this morning. New York Times bestseller list. Woohoo. Yeah, I that's that's I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> so give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs. I'm on Twitter at Susan Page and on Facebook at Susan Page USA Today. And my book is being sold every place books are sold, Amazon or your local bookstore great to support local bookstores or barnes and noble or wherever you buy books there you go there you go what motivated you to write this book what was it that said this is the book that i need to write next you think of barbara bush and nancy pelosi as being pretty different people and there are some big differences between them but they both had the same appeal to me as people that work on biography stuff one thing i thought they were important had an impact on our country secondly i thought they were not fully understood and I think underestimated in some ways. And thirdly, they were a little controversial. Barbara Bush, a little controversial. Nancy Pelosi, very controversial. And so those were the things that made me think this would be an interesting thing to explore. There you go. And uh, so give us an arcing overview of the book, what it entails, what goes inside of it. I tried to do uh, a 360 degree portrait of Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi. So I, her grandparents immigrated from Italy. I hired a researcher in Rome to go to the villages that they left. I explored her remarkable childhood in Baltimore, where she was born into political royalty. Her father, the larger than life mayor of, of Baltimore. I went to San Francisco, uh, where of course she got her own political roots. And I spent a lot of time talking to her. I ended up interviewing 150 people for this book. I had 10 interviews with Speaker Pelosi 
for this book. So I wanted to not be pro Pelosi or anti Pelosi. I wasn't arguing she was great or terrible. I was arguing she's been important. Is this important to you to do? These are two books about two women that have been just incredible influencers in politics and everything else. Was it important for you to do a second book on women and and promote that? Or was it just this was somebody that you thought would be great for this uh, story? So that's a great question, because you, the second thing I said was somebody who's been underestimated. And I would be delighted to do a book about a man who's been underestimated. But I got to say, I found more women who fell into that category. And that was true for, I think, both of these women. Now, Nancy Pelosi, I think, underestimated a little less since the election of Donald Trump. And she emerged, of course, as the kind of the face of the Democratic opposition to President Trump. But it through her through her this long career where she's been really a, a remarkably consequential speaker of the House, I think she has not always gotten the credit that she was due. Mm-hmm. What was your opinion? Last night, it was interesting. We had a seminal moment in American history where for the first time we had two women and also uh, women of uh, multiracial background uh, sitting behind Biden at a presidential address to Congress. What was your thoughts on that? I thought that was nice. Not apart from what party they belong to, just the fact that our democracy is becoming a little bigger, a little more inclusive. I thought that was nice. Now, the thing I'm waiting for, Christos, when the president speaking at the state of the uh, union the joint session will be female we haven't had that yet but i did i thought it was a nice tableau i thought it was a i thought it was an encouraging thing for uh young women and for little girls to see mm-hmm. yeah it's a step in the right direction i think hopefully we're making baby steps to the, <laughs> to the right thing i certainly would like to see a female president i think women have a whole lot more empathy and and they care more about the future of stuff where uh, a lot of us guys were just running around starting wars and stuff, which is our thing. So as you said, though, with this interviewing Nancy Pelosi, this is pretty interesting. You got access to 10 different interviews with her. How did those interviews go? And I thought it was interesting. You got the contract for the deal, to my understanding, before you even knew if you were going to get interviews with her. How did that work out? So possibly a stupid thing to do. I'll let you judge that. But I signed the contract to do this book and to do the first book without talking to the subjects. And Mm -hmm. Here was my, you can agree or disagree with my reasoning. My reasoning was, I didn't want them to feel like they were giving me permission to do the book. I didn't want them to feel like they would have some say over what I covered in either book. And in fact, there were things in each book that they did not want me to include that I included. But I wanted them to be works of journalism, not authorized biographies. Now, that said, I had interviewed each of them over the years in covering politics. And I thought there was a good chance that they would give me, each of them would give me at least some interviews. But I went into the, I went into the, but I didn't have any deal. There was no arrangement. I go into the first interview with Speaker Pelosi and she offers me a Dove bar. And of course she's a big chocoholic. So this is like a good sign that she's offering me a Dove bar and she takes a Dove bar. And I bite into this Dove bar and the chocolate shell then shatters into little shards all over her carpet all of her pristine off-white carpet in the speaker's office. So there I am trying to make a good impression, desperately picking up little melting pieces of chocolate. And I thought, she is never going to let me back in her office. Now, she did, 10 interviews and all, but she never again served food. I thought that was a great story too when I heard it because I've seen her, I seen that they made a big deal of it. So they made it into a thing, but I saw her open her uh, fridge drawer once and she loves chocolate. Yeah. All that stuff. So as you sat down with her and made the choices to lay out this book, what sort of aspect? Like I, when I sit and interview people, I lay down a, a guide rule of, okay, how do I want to do this interview and stuff? What was your parameters that you sat down and said, how do I want to do this book and lay this out for the reader? So in the first interview, I wanted her to understand that it was going to be a serious book. It was going to be fair-minded. It wasn't going to be either an advertisement for or an attack on her. And so in that first interview, it was pretty general stuff about how she was operating as speaker. And then in future interviews, I would give her staff a heads up saying, I'd really want to talk at this interview about her mother and father. Or I really want to talk in this interview about her experiences as the mother of five children. Because she would, this was 12 things were happening. That was Every day is a newsmaking day for Nancy Pelosi. And I wanted her to just have some, not to get whiplash when she comes in after some big showdown with President Trump. And I say, tell me about your mom. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely him. 
it's been an interesting five years, that's for sure, and especially for her. But then uh, also uh, just an extraordinary sort of response that she's had. to. I don't think – let me ask you this. Do you think any Speaker of the House could have done better with dealing with Donald Trump over the last five years than she did? Another Speaker of the House would have done things differently. There's not just one approach, even to a president who is as disruptive as President Trump was. But I think that Democrats believe – even Democrats who weren't crazy about Nancy Pelosi staying in power, Democrats came to believe that she was just the right person at the right time, that given the challenges that President Trump's election was going to pose to Democrats, that she had this incredible background of dealing with problems and people and the caucus that made her, it's like her whole life was training for this final showdown. And we, I guess we do think this is... We do think she's coming to the end of her her career. I think this is probably her last term as speaker, probably her last term as a member of Congress. So there's a little bit of a valedictory quality, I think, to the things that she's doing now. And you lay this out in the book that from her beginnings, from her childhood, from, from being born to being all the way through uh, here and her different influences. Tell us about the story you weave. You talk about her father and her family, et cetera, et cetera. What's interesting is when I was interviewing people in San Francisco who had known Nancy Pelosi for decades, some of them were unaware that she came from a political family in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, she has a different last name than her father. She took her husband's name when they got married. She had moved from one coast to the other. But she was born into what amounted to political royalty in Baltimore. The D'Alessandros of Baltimore were as prominent as the Kennedys were in Boston. Her father was a five-term congressman from Baltimore. He then became a three-term mayor. He sought, He ran for the Senate. At one point, he was trying to run for governor. That didn't work out. But he was a big figure in Baltimore and in democratic politics generally. He was close to FDR. He named his second son Franklin Delano Roosevelt D'Alessandro. Uh, wow. Poor baby, getting a name like that, a mouthful. He, was, he knew Harry Truman. He called Harry Truman boss. He was mayor of Baltimore at a time. Baltimore was a loomed a little larger on the American scene than it does now. And at a time that big city mayors were really kingmakers, in the Democratic Party. That's the family that Nancy Pelosi was born into. When she was born, all the Baltimore papers covered it. There was a picture in the Baltimore News Post from hours after her birth of her in her mother's arms in a hospital bed, surrounded by her five brothers and her father. Would it be fair to say she was born into a political sort of a dynasty of some sort or uh, yeah. full awareness and proudness and the whole animal of politics? So her father, a prominent politician, her brother also became a mayor of Baltimore and her mother, way ahead of her time, smart, restless, ambitious, entrepreneurial, risk taker, loved to bet, loved to play the ponies at Pimlico, sometimes got in <laughs> debt to the bookies uh -oh. in Little Italy and organized politics, organized, did the political organizational job for her husband. So big Nancy D'Alessandro was also a force in Nancy Pelosi's life. And so do you think that she's more, does she have the aspects that you found in your book of more the characteristics of her father or her mother? Is there a dominant? So I, I think here's my thesis. She was her mother. She was her mother's daughter until she was 47. She, that is, she was active in politics, but she never ran for office. She didn't think about running for office. She focused on raising her five children. She thought of herself as a fundraiser and organizer, not as a candidate. When she was 47 years old, another woman, Sally Burton, a member of Congress from San Francisco who was dying, urged her to run for office. And she decided to run for that congressional seat. And at that point, she became her father's daughter, the person who was actually in office. So I think there was a kind of pivot there in middle age. And, and that was what's most interesting about Nancy Pelosi is she starts very late in life to get into politics or at least run for office. And then she has an enormous amount of children in a very short period of time. And, and of course, now she has a, a huge grandchildren family. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So she's got five kids. She has nine grandchildren with whom she is close. And it, she did get a late start. A lot of members of Congress get elected as soon as they can find a district to run in. But she, she makes this point. She says that 
raising five children and she had these five children in a span of six years and a week. That is a pretty rapid pace of building a family. You can imagine what that household must have been like. She says that managing that household with five kids was the best possible training to be speaker of the house because you're every, it's always chaos. You're trying to impose order on chaos. You've got all these people with grievances, some of them real and some of them imagined. You're constantly forming, shifting alliances. You need to try to persuade either members of Congress or your children to do something they don't want to do and maybe persuade them it was their idea in the first place. She says those the skills that she learned as a mother are the skills she uses every day as Speaker of the House. That's awesome. And that's what I always assume because we have five kids and, and all the grandchildren that come from that. You're definitely going to learn to manage people. I've had people say, how, how are you so good with kids and stuff? And I'm like, I've had a lot of them. How do you feel that your book or how do you think uh, that your book shapes up uh, around other Pelosi biographies? Uh, is it different uh, or shaped differently? Or how do you feel that you categorize within some of the other competing biographies of her? There, there are a couple other biographies of Nancy Pelosi. None of them and they all have value. There was an early biography of her by Mark Sandalo, who was a San Francisco Chronicle reporter who covered her. And when she became speaker the first time in 2007, he wrote a biography of her that was really helpful to me, uh, especially about her history in California politics. But I, here's my book is the first one that takes her up to present day. The oh. book ends with January 6th. It is based on more interviews than I believe she has ever done with a reporter working on a biography of her. For Mark Sandalo, for whatever reason, she didn't give him any interviews for the book, although he had interviewed her in his job as, with, as covering her for the San Francisco Chronicle. So I think I have the benefit of a little bit of perspective that the other books do not have. But you know what? The other authors might make a similar case. So you should write, read them all and decide for yourself. <laughs> there you go. And then you have 150 interviews. So I thought it was interesting. You've got the 10 interviews with Pelosi, and then you've got 150 interviews of people who know her, and you've got that uh, wonderful mix that you can mix together and, and, and present. Yeah, and I, was, I felt fortunate in the people who agreed to talk to me. President Obama, I had an interview with him mm. for the book. Newt Gingrich, who had been a longtime <laughs> foil of Nancy Pelosi. I interviewed him. He described, he said that he disagreed with Pelosi on policy, but thought she was really skilled at their mutual craft. And he called her a fellow pirate. <laughs> really? You know, and for Newt Gingrich, I think fellow pirate is probably intended as a compliment. Definitely. I was talking about your book with my big clubhouse app. I don't know if you've gotten on the clubhouse app yet, but uh, we usually have uh, pr pretty big rooms in there. We have our little uh, click that shows up every night in our club. And I was talking about your book and pulling my audience for questions for you and uh, promoting your book, of course, as well, too. And I was reading down through the page for your book on, on, on the publisher, and I came to Newt Gingrich's name as like a review on the book. And I'm like, what? Am I, am I seeing correctly what's going on here? So that was quite surprising. I was like, well, that's something then. I wanted, I, those, so those blurbs, I, I don't know if they sell books or not. I hope so. But I have a blurb from Madeleine Albright, who I interviewed for the book. She was very helpful. But I didn't think this is some Democratic case for Nancy Pelosi. So I also thought, let's get a Republican in there. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I, I, I like your approach to the book. It almost sounds like you, you try and uh, give as fair as possible, but almost a conduit through your interviews and everything and the details. You're just trying to write uh, a history that seems to be fairly unbiased. Is that kind of how you approached it? Yeah, I approach it like I approach my job at USA Today. And sometimes you do stories that have a positive tilt, and sometimes you do stories that have a negative tilt. But the, the important thing is to try to, for me, is to try to be three-dimensional. None of us are all good or all bad. And what I wanted to look at was who is Nancy Pelosi and how has she managed to get so much power and hold on to it and wield it in a way very few Pauls have managed to do. She does have a lot of, that was some of the, the questions that I got last night was how is she dealing with the AOC sort of area of her thing and managing that. And a lot of people feel that they push her around, but I, I think I corrected them and said, I don't think that's the case. I think Pelosi's an incredible manager. Yeah, there's definitely been some friction. Their relationship has been complicated. I think that members of the squad early on tried to push her around 
And I think that they are more reluctant to do that now because <laughs> Pelosi, there's a there's a phrase that John Bresnahan, who is a now a reporter for Punchbowl News, he was a longtime reporter, congressional reporter for Politico. He did a profile about 11 years ago for Politico about Pelosi, and he described her as an iron fist in a Gucci glove, an <laughs> iron fist in a Gucci glove. And that is just about the perfect description of how Nancy Pelosi wields power. She uses a Gucci glove when she can. She'll persuade you. She'll coax you along. If she needs to persuade you in a firmer way, she will pull out that iron fist. And I think that is a lesson that members of the squad have learned. I, somebody asked last night the story about the finger, the, that similar <laughs> moment in the thing. And somebody said, I'd like to know what all the men thought in the room. And I'm like, you can look at their faces. Anybody who's been schooled by their mom knows, has that face like, oh, wow. Okay. I don't know if you want to comment on that moment. That was yeah. Look at General Milley. He looks like he's praying. Yeah, he's, he's a general. <laughs> he may be praying. The, the, most of the other men are like looking at their shoes and it seems to be a, a cabinet room full of only men and Pelosi. Actually, Liz Cheney is in the room. It's just that she's obscured by the man uh, sitting next to her. That was the last time that Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump ever had a conversation. Wow. October 2019. Think about that. They then go for a year and a couple months with him as president and the Speaker of the House. Never speak again. It's supposed to be a meeting about Syria. It became a conflict over impeachment. She stood up and jabbed her finger at him, then led a Democratic walkout. Pelo Trump, as Pelosi was leaving, referred to her as a third-rate politician. He was speaking to Steny Hoyer, the Democratic majority leader. Steny Hoyer told me when I talked to him for the book that he didn't hear him say that, but that if he had heard him, he would have turned to the president and said, if she's a, a third-rate politician, I'm a fifth-rate politician, and you're not a politician at all. But here's, a, here's something funny about that picture. Okay, so the only reason we have that picture is the White House immediately put it out because they thought it made Pelosi look unhinged. And Pelosi immediately distributed it everywhere, made it her banner on her Twitter account. She used it in fundraising appeals because she thought it made it look like she was in charge. But here's a funny thing. In doing the book, I came across another picture of Pelosi doing the exact same gesture to Barack Obama really? in the Oval Office, they're meeting, they're standing up face to face. She is jabbing her, her finger at him, her right hand, a identical look on her face and identical gesture. And he has reached forward and put his hand over her hand. And it is not entirely clear whether he's trying to calm her or trying to protect himself. <laughs> Either way, I think every good son knows the mom finger. That's she's done. That's it. That's mom's upset. Mom's not good. It's time to run for the hill. There's another great moment and a story that you told that I had heard before about the small tearing that she was doing during the, the address of uh, Donald Trump. And then, of course, what she finalizes in. And that's and it's, when I saw the uh, Harris and, and her on the dais last night uh, on the stage, I, I was like thinking of that moment. Do you want to tell that story if you would? Chris, first, I, I remember that night so clearly, the 2020 State of the Union. What did you think when she stood up and tore up the speech? I thought that I was in a dream state. I thought that I was dreaming. I fortunately, I think I was watching it on on something where I could stop it and rewind it. One of these uh, web, you know, DVR things, and <clears throat> I was like, "Did I just watch?" And I I was kind of like half watching in my thing. And it was the end, and I'm like, "Let's see what happens here." And I watched it, and I was just like, "It was surreal." I was like, "Wait, this is." I must be like asleep or something. This is not, this is not happening. And I rewinded it and I'm like, holy mother. And you can tell the vice president Pence is, is just. I Pence was, I don't see anything. I can't <laughs> see anything that is happening. And afterwards, I'd never seen anything like that. I've been in Washington 150 years. I'd never seen anything like that. And afterwards, there were some pictures that, that zoomed in on her speech text before she talked. And it saw, saw these little tears. In the margin, and there was all the speculation. She pl she walked into that speech planning to do this. It was all a, a strategy, a theme. She told, me, but I talked to her about this in in an interview, and she said that's not what happened. She said that what happened was she couldn't find a pen, so she's sitting up there, and Trump come, President Trump comes in and hands her the speech text, which is customary at a State of the Union address, 
And she's speed reading it, scanning through it before he delivers it. And she says something he says in the speech text that she thinks is not true. And she wants to make like a little mark there so she can get back to this point later on and make and challenge it as not being true. And she can't find a pen. You're Speaker of the House. You do not really carry your purse up with you to the to the dais for the State of the Union. There's a little drawer. There was a little drawer in front of her. She opens the drawer. It's empty. No pen. So she makes a little tear in the margin of the paper so she can find this thing that she thinks is not true. Then she finds a second thing and makes a second little tear. And then she finds a third thing. She makes a third little tear. And by the time she gets to the end of the speech, there are rips up and down the margin of the speech text of things that she thinks aren't correct. And she told me that she hadn't decided what to do about it. And then the president honored Rush Limbaugh who, as you remember, was up in the first lady's box. So that kind of steamed the Democrats. They see Rush Limbaugh as a pretty toxic and partisan figure. And by the end of the speech, Trump had managed to do something he almost never did, which was get under her skin in public. And she said she decided that if he was going to shred the truth, she would shred his speech. And she stood up and she it was too thick to tear in half all at once. She divided into four sections, tore each of them in half, threw the paper down on the desk as Mike P- Trump is in front of her basking in applause from the Republicans in the hall. Mike Pence is next to her applauding, pretending I can see nothing. That has to go down as one of the greatest scenes ever in American history. Like so hopefully 200 years from now, they're playing. <laughs> it's just, it was extraordinary. I just sat there and I just went, this can't be happening. This is surreal. And I kept replaying it. And I was talking to people online. I'm like, did you, did I just, am I crazy? Did I just see what I saw? But yeah, it was, it was quite the statement, if you will. <laughs> And Democrats, I think, were a little divided about Democrats generally march behind Nancy Pelosi wherever she wants to lead them when the issue is Donald Trump. And some of them thought that was a good thing to do to show that she didn't respect his speech. Other Democrats thought it was went too far, that it was disrespectful, not of Donald Trump so much as of the president who is there giving a, a big speech. So there was it was one of the few occasions in which there were some Democrats who had Second, we're second guessing Nancy Pelosi. Wow. As you write the book, what was there any stories or any things that you found that surprised you and are going to really surprise readers when they buy the book and read it? The most surprising thing to me was her mom, both how interesting and complicated her mom was, how what kind of training her mother provided. Her, her mother kept something called the favor file. And You don't need to ask me what the favor file is because it is exactly what it sounds like it is. It is a big file of the record of favors that the D'Alessandros did for voters, for constituents, for people in their neighborhood. Big Nancy would sit at a table, a big table in their in their front room in their house in Little Italy, the house they moved into when uh, Tommy D'Alessandro and she had been married. And constituents would actually line up, sometimes spilling out into the sidewalk to come and say, I have a housing problem, or my son's in jail, can you help? Or my, my mother-in-law has an immigration issue, can you help? And Nancy D'Alessandro, first as the wife of a member of Congress, and then as the wife of the mayor, would often be able to intervene with city agencies or whatever to help people. And she would keep a card that said, so-and-so came in on this day, needed this help. This is what we did. And then later on, when they needed some, when some future person needed help that this person might be able to help on, they would turn them to, re- to return the favor. And of course, they did expect people who had gotten favors in the favor file to show up and vote on election day. So it is politics 101. Just one other thing about big Nancy D'Alessandro. She was very entrepreneurial. And she invented a machine to give women facials. She promised that this machine would make your skin very youthful and wrinkle-free. And she patented it. She I went and found the, actually my researcher went and found the patent applications at the U.S. Patent Office. And one of, one of my kids last year went online to eBay and found one of these facial machines, wow. Nancy D'Alessandro's Beauty by Vapor. He bought it for me, gave it to me for my birthday. I plug it in. It still works. It's really? Still cre- you pour in 
some water or some precious oils and it creates steam. Now I can't guarantee that it gives you youthful wrinkle-free skin, but I can tell you it was still operational. That's pretty awesome. And I imagine this has a huge impact on Nancy and, and how she's raised and, and understanding the, the issues of politics. It made her sophisticated about politics. It made her able to understand what motivates people, what motivates voters. And it made her fearless. Before Nancy Pelosi told me that before she was allowed to open the front door, she was too young to open the front door if an adult wasn't there. She was calling city agencies and trying to track down help. <laughs> for people for the favor file. That's brilliant. Out of all the 150 interviews you did, what interview do you think is going to surprise people the most? Or what did you think was the most insightful? I'd ask you what your favorite was, but I don't want to make you enemies with uh, all the other 149. Any thoughts on that? There were a couple interviews that were really interesting and fun. There's one though that was surprising. I did a lot of research into the friction between Nancy Pelosi and the squad, between Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the other three progressive young women who make up the squad. I did an interview with Ilhan Omar, who is the mm -hmm. congresswoman from Minneapolis, who is a member of the squad. And she had an, an experience with Nancy Pelosi that is an example of her Gucci glove rather than her iron fist. She won the Democratic primary to, for this congressional seat, which was over a crowded field, an impressive field, wasn't clear who was going to win, in a very Democratic district, the most Democratic district in Minnesota, perhaps the most Democratic district in the upper Midwest. And so Nancy Pelosi, she doesn't know, Nancy Pelosi calls her the next morning, the morning after the primary, and says, congratulations on winning the Democratic primary. I'll see you in Congress in November, because there was no question that she was going to win this election. And it was as though Nancy Pelosi was like checking off a box. Okay, Ilhan Omar, she's all set. And Ilhan Omar said, who was a refugee to this country, said, told Pelosi she had a big concern, which was he, she wears a hijab around her uh, head, covers her hair. And she, she noted that there was a house rule that prevented headgear from being worn on the floor of the house. Mm. And she was worried that she would not be allowed to go on the floor of the house to vote and to debate because of that. And Pelosi said, don't worry about it. I can take care of that for you. And Ilhan Omar continued to worry about that, which Nancy Pelosi understood. And she started to check in with her over and over again, just to reassure her to see how things were going. So much so that when Pelosi would call Ilhan Omar's campaign office, aides would say to Ilhan Omar, Auntie Nancy is on the phone. <laughs> and of course, when she was elected and came on the House floor, Pelosi indeed had arranged for that rule to be changed so that she didn't have any problems. Now that's, Ilhan Omar has a the, that's the depth of a relationship that is going to take those two members of Congress a long way, even when they have conflicts. I think if I recall rightly, correct me if I'm wrong, AOC, the first day of office, I think she holds a sit-in in Pelosi's office, which is the interesting way to start a relationship. Yeah, it's like not. It's like do, signing a contract to do a biography without checking with the subject first. It's like pretty risky. It was actually even before she'd been sworn in. Oh, it was a sit-in by the Sunrise Movement. She didn't really know Pelosi. She had, I think, talked to her a few times, but it, she had AOC, of course, had ousted Joe Crowley, a very senior member of Congress who was close to Pelosi in that Democratic primary in New York. Anyway, there's the Sunrise Movement is having a sit-in in Pelosi's office for climate change. And the Congresswoman elect comes and joins them, which oh. is either very gutsy or pretty stupid. <laughs> Poke the bear. That's uh, There you go. In your book, one of the questions that my audience had for you was, do you uh, cover anything between Mitch McConnell and, and Pelosi? <laughs> So you do not want to go to Thanksgiving dinner that has both Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi at it because they do not get along. Here's a story that hadn't been told before that Pelosi herself didn't tell me this, but I found it in doing research for the book. Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies and Pelosi contacts McConnell and says, I would like to have Justice Ginsburg lie in state that is in the rotunda. That is a very great honor accorded to very few. And Mitch McConnell says, no. <laughs> he says no because, as he noted, there's no precedent for a Supreme Court justice to lie in state. Pelosi's view was Ruth G G Bader Ginsburg was not just any 
Supreme Court justice. She had been an iconic figure, especially for women and girls. Mitch McConnell was not moved. So Nancy Pelosi had Ruth Bader Ginsburg lie in state on the House side. She couldn't use the rotunda because that would require Mitch McConnell's permission. The rotunda is between the two houses of Congress. She had the ceremony in Statuary Hall, which is on the House side, not quite as grand a setting as the rotunda, invited both Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy, the House Republican leader, to the ceremony. Neither of them attended. If you were a betting person, how how much do you think that made a difference in the election with her passing away and, and how it was treated and stuff by politicians in that way that you talk about? How big of a difference do you think that brought out the vote? Or uh, if you want to expand on, or, or uh, you know, if you want to speculate on that. Chris, I'd be interested in your view on this, but my view is this election in 2020 was all about Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure I think other things figured into impeachment. We thought impeachment was going to be the huge political issue. The issues that mattered were Donald Trump and especially Donald Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. So I'm inclined to think other things are, were really on the margins. What do you think about that? How would, if you were a betting person, and I bet you are, how would you, what would you I say? Would, I would definitely agree with you. It, it definitely came down to that. I did see a lot of women, though, who, after she passed, and of course, the way it was treated, and of course, there was an interesting aspect to it where you couldn't go to the funeral in mass. There probably would have been tons of people if it hadn't been for coronavirus. I think I, I, I saw a lot of my female co friends and stuff that were saying, I'm, <clears throat> I'm standing up, make sure I vote for my daughter, women's rights. This is an important thing. We, we need to make sure and, and stand up. I don't know how much of a difference that made on the scale on weighing it, but I thought it was definitely interesting. So I guess we'll have to leave that to the historians to decide, to smarter people than myself. But I thought it was the, uh, so one question that my uh, audience also have, is there any vulnerable moments of Nancy Pelosi that anyone's seen, you've seen, or maybe you document in the book where there's issues of, uh, there's areas of vulnerability? Because we always see that political Nancy Pelosi and, and there's that mask there and stuff. Is Does anyone ever get behind the mask other than her immediate family, maybe? She's pretty disciplined. She's pretty mm-hmm. guarded. She's very private. I asked Barbara Bush if I could see her high school transcripts and she laughed and said sure and wrote a letter saying although i fear she will be disappointed i give susan page permission to see my transcripts i asked pelosi if i could see her high school transcripts and she acted like she looked like i had asked to rifle through her closets and she said no (laughs) she said no she's a shy she's a private person so i think it is hard to see i think it's hard to get through that guardedness and that discipline. I will tell you about an interview I did with her two weeks ago. Now, this was an interview not for the book, which was already printed at that point, but an interview for USA Today. And it was the first time I had a chance to talk with her about January 6th. And she said that she was up there presiding over the house when security, a security agent came up and said, you have to, I have to, we have to leave. And she didn't think it was something that was going to be very serious. She did not understand what was happening. In fact, so much so that she left her phone up there thinking she was going to be right back. So they escort her out. Of course, at that point, it's clear that the security situation is becoming very perilous. They take her to a uh, secure location where other congressional leaders are as well. Uh, They watch this on TV, as all of us uh, were doing. I said to her, if the mob had caught you, would they have killed you? And she said, yes. She said that was what they had set out to do. And then she said, but they would have had a battle on their hands because (laughs) I'm a street fighter. And then she, this 81 year old woman lifts up her foot pretty high, shows me her four inch stilettos, which are a signature and says, besides, I would have had these as a weapon. (laughs) That tells you a little about how fearless Nancy Pelosi can be. That is a brilliant story because I've always wondered what she thought. I'd like to get an honest opinion someday from Mike Pence if it's even possible to get one out of him. But uh, I mean, you, if anybody with half a brain knew that was, we, we really came close to just the most worst episode in American history probably ever. 
at that moment. As we get uh, rounded out, <clears throat> is there anything we haven't touched on in your book that can encourage people to buy it and, and everything else on, on top of what we've already covered? Any Anything that we may have missed that you think is a great encouragement for readers? Let me just mention what I concluded after doing all this research, which is we know Nancy Pelosi is in the history books because she's the first woman to be speaker. She is, I think, without question, the most powerful woman in the history of the American government. But the fact is, she would be in the history books if she were male because of some of the things that she did as speaker. She was the one personally responsible for pushing through that unpopular bank bailout in 2008 that voters didn't like, but economists say probably prevented us from heading into another depression. And she is singularly responsible for enactment of the Affordable Care Act, the big comprehensive version of that bill. Now you may think, some Americans think it's great. Some Americans think don't like the Affordable Care Act, but we would not have it if Nancy Pelosi had not been Speaker of the House at the time it was being considered. And that is something that Barack Obama told me when I interviewed him for this book. There you go. Now I noticed behind you, if you don't mind, uh, there's four, uh, five, I think, or more baseballs. Are you a collector of baseballs or is that... My husband is a lifetime baseball fanboy, and we have he has baseball signed by Joe DiMaggio and Cal Ripken Jr. and Willie Mays. So we actually have, he has about two dozen balls. You just can't see them all here. Huh. He's also, you may, on the other side is a USA license plate game. I don't know if you can see that. He, that is also just a family favorite. We play the license plate game quite a bit. I remember, I remember playing that when we do the drives across America. Yeah, the ABC, is that it? Yeah, we, my, my husband in particular does it we used to, before coronavirus just does it in DC because there's so many people from across the country here. We hope that can resume once we get past this pandemic. Yeah, we're almost out of it. So give us your plugs where people can uh, find out more about you and of course, order up the book. One of my kids actually created a webpage for me, uh, which is called uh, susanpagedc.com. And I don't know where else they can go. I'm <laughs> they, can, <laughs> they can follow order me the on Twitter. There you, go. Page. there you go. Order the book up from your local booksellers and Amazon too. Uh, take and get the get a copy of it. I've got a copy and it's wonderful and it's really insightful. You go into really great detail and everything else. Thank you so much, Susan, for being on the show. It's been an honor to have you and wonderful interview. And uh, thank you very much. Chris Voss, it has been an honor to be on your show. Thank you very much. And order up the book, Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi and Lessons of Power by Susan Page. I think you'll love it. And uh, you can check out her other book on Barbara Bush, which I, and Barbara Bush was just such a wonderful person. She's like the grandma to everybody. At least that's how I saw her. There you go. To be honest, thanks for tuning in. Go to youtube.com for Chess Chris Foss, all of our groups on Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, or and uh, what is it? <laughs> Instagram and LinkedIn. Thanks to all of uh, you for tuning in and we'll see you guys next time.